beginning in Matthew 27, the 15th verse. And again, thank you for sharing Christ with us on television. I am reading. Now, it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. Time of Passover. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So, when the crowd had gathered, Pilate uh, asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Well, for he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man. For I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. I guess it was really a nightmare. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you as the governor? Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting. He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood. He said, it is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. And all of God's people said, my text, my title today, it is in a form of a question. Really a compound question in the end of this message. But the basic question today before you in my title is, what will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? For those of you sharing on television, just recently celebrated my 65th birthday uh, in 1972, I was 21 years old when Bill Withers wrote a song entitled, Who is He and What is He to You? The heart of my message to you listening and watching on television is, who is Jesus to you? And what is He to you? In other words, what is your relationship with him? Who and what Jesus is to you has everything to do with how you personally answered Pilate's question to the Jews, what will you do with Jesus? In my text verses, Pilate, the Roman appointed governor of the Jews in Jerusalem, he's trying to get away from judging Jesus who has been charged with the crime of insurrection, rising up against Roman authority. Uh, Jesus does not deny that he is king of the Jews, but Pilate sees him as no threat to Caesar, sees him as no threat to Rome, he sees this as a religious matter between Jesus and these Jews, and he doesn't want to be involved in it. He does something we get stuck in. We really don't want to be in it. I'm going to help somebody here today. We just get stuck in it. Since the Jewish leaders insist on putting Jesus to death, but they can't do so without Pilate's approval, they got He's, he's got to do something. They put the pressure, as we would say, they put the hammer on the boy. Uh, first, he tries, as this little symbol here, he tries to what we call pass the buck. Sometimes you don't want to make a decision. Uh, you don't want to be involved. 
you try to pass it on to someone else. No, you can't keep it. You got to pass the buck. And sometimes, if you finish passing the buck, and this has happened in my own personal life, not only did the buck end up back with me, I realized I should have never passed it in the first place because now the issue has become more complicated as it has involved so many more people. I want you to know Matthew 27, again, verses 15 to 18, so you can see this concept of Pilate trying to pass the buck. The Jews during Passover, the governor allowed them to release a prisoner. They had, of course, Barabbas was there. And Pilate said, well, which one do you want me to release to you? Uh, Barabbas or, or Jesus? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had what? Handed Jesus over to him. What, what you, what's not there on the surface is that Pilate was actually very smart in trying to do this. He remembered how five days earlier, Jesus had entered Jerusalem on a donkey, and all the people were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who come in the name of the Lord. He remembered how this man had done so many things, and people were praising him and lifting him up. Pilate was sure people would choose Jesus over Barabbas. However, the Pilate's dismay, the people chose Barabbas because Jewish leaders told them to, if you will know, verses 20 and 21. The chief priest and the elder persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. They chose Barabbas, and now we understand. If we will take deeper insights into the Word of God, that Jesus' impending death is not only for the self-righteous, it's not only for the morally upright, but Jesus' impending death is for Barabbas too. Because Jesus goes to Calvary and stands in Barabbas' place. See, we talk so much about Calvary in relationship to us, which is true. His death was vicarious. It was substitutionary for us. But the first person it was substitutionary for was Barabbas. We don't bring that up. And Barabbas was the most vile and vicious of criminals and Jesus died for him. Some of you watching on television are in prison right now, and you are not falsely accused. Matter of fact, if they knew everything you did, you'd never get out. But I want you to know Jesus died for you as well as everyone else who puts their faith and trust in him. The Bible scholar Matthew Henry says these words, Is not Barabbas preferred to Jesus? When sinners reject salvation, that they may retain their darling sins, which rob God of his glory and murder their souls. After the people choose Barabbas over Jesus, we have one of the most dramatic and precious passages of Scripture in the Bible. Verse number 22 again. What shall I do then with Jesus? who is called the Messiah, Pilate, as. This shows you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, how fickle people are, because they all answered, crucify him. A few weeks earlier, their answer would have been entirely different. A few weeks earlier, they would have chosen Jesus. It was Jesus whom the people loved. It was Jesus who was healing the sick. It was Jesus who was casting out demons. It was Jesus that was raising the dead. It was Jesus that was feeding the multitude. A few weeks earlier, they would have chosen. See, y'all got to get past this rain. A few weeks earlier, they would have chosen. 
that's one reason in my ministry I've never gotten hung up on what people say about me or anything. The Bible says if you seek, and I especially speak to ministers, if you seek to please men, how will you be the servant of Jesus Christ? Sometimes I have to make stands on things that people have serious issues with me about. And I have to just take the heat from those stands because if someone doesn't stand for what's right, everybody goes down. But when people's sins are exposed and their wrongs are exposed, they usually turn right on the pastor. They turn right on the preacher. They love them until he get in their house, until he get in their business. Now, why he got to be messing in my business? He, what I'm talking about, them people down the street. But brothers and sisters, but now, under Roman guard, these Jews see an apparent beaten, beraggled, bloodied, shabby looking Jesus. He looks like he's got no power. He looks like he's got no might. He looks like he can't even help himself. And under looking at that Jesus... They said, crucify him. He's helpless and defenseless. Ladies and gentlemen, those you share with me on television, every generation, every individual must make their own decision about what to do with Jesus. In the 21st century, people need Jesus less with every generation. We are now in what's called the post-Christian age. Everyone does what they want to do. But I want you to listen carefully, especially you young people sharing on television and under the sound of my voice. It has been said, Jesus is a friend of sinners, but many millennials are unfriending him. Uh, they know it. See, the people who don't know computers don't know what I'm talking about. They don't, those on social media, what do you mean unfriend? Y'all know. You're on Facebook, Instagram, all this stuff. They are unfriending him. Now, listen carefully. At a time when their lives are being shaped and their trajectory set towards the future. You see, what young people in this, that 1984 range and that 30-year-old range, at a time in their life, when some of the most important decisions they ever will make are being made, they're leaving Jesus out the picture. I love him, Pastor. I love her. Oh, well, I want to do this. I want to do that. Well, I want, I'm not in the church because the church doesn't allow me to do my own thing. And so at that point, the next thing you know, they're in all kind of difficulties, all kind of problems, because except the Lord build the house, they that labor, labor in vain. But because Christianity appears to be restrictive, and because Christianity doesn't seem to allow them to do what they want to do, they make decisions as if Jesus doesn't exist, and his word doesn't mean anything to them. And how many of you know, under the sound of my voice, those are decisions that are paid for in the next 10 20, 30, 40 years of their life. This is the age in which we find ourselves. When you unfriend Jesus, you must accept responsibility for your choices. Like the people's choosing Barabbas over Jesus. Brother and sister, irrespective of the people accepting responsibility for their actions, Ultimately, it was Pilate's, not the people's decision to crucify Jesus. And note carefully, verse 22, I want you to look carefully. I'm, I'm trying to help you become more of a Bible student. In Matthew 27 and 22, note how this is put. It does not say, Pilate does not say, what will you do or what will we do with Jesus? Pilate said, what shall I do. That's critical. Well, why is this critical? Because it shows you he knew he had the ultimate power to make the decision, not the people. Brothers and sisters, this is a very serious part of our message today. It is always a sin when people have the power to act, to make a difference, and do nothing. 
There's a quote by Martin Luther King dealing with how good people don't respond. No. Read it out loud. The silence of the good people is more dangerous than the brutality of the bad people. You just can't look at wrong and, and do nothing. That's why we should all be trying to do everything within our own individual power to make this world a better place, to impact our community, to stop this violence, to make our families better. We got to do what we can do because within our own individual abilities, God holds every one of us accountable. And when we just go silent, we allow bad people to rule and bad decisions to be made. You see, brothers and sisters, like some people, Pilate was a responsibility shifter. Let me move on quickly so we can be done. We first saw this in Adam in Scripture. He's the first responsibility shifter. What do you mean? That's somebody who passes the buck. All right, y'all sent it. Wait a minute, Adam. I told you not to eat of the fruit. <laughs> Man, it ain't my fault, God. And I want you to know it's Lord God in Scripture, which means Jehovah Elohim, because as Elohim, he's the creator God. As Jehovah, he is as Lord. He is the covenant-making God. And so what God now, instead of just saying when God saw them, it was when the Lord God, because now Adam had broken the covenant that he had made with God, and God was now holding him accountable. You ate from the tree of the knowledge of good, which I told you not to eat from. You could not eat from that tree. You see that woman you gave me. <laughs> forgot he was lonely. Forgot there was nobody there for him out of all creation. Forgot God had been good to him and given him eat, but because he was a responsibility shifter, it is your fault, God. See, that's what responsibility shifter people do. They know how to put the blame back on you, though they did it. Go to Eve. <laughs> that ain't my fault, that serpent. You hadn't let him in the garden, we'd have been straight. Poor serpent. He ain't got nobody left to turn to. <laughs> let me hear you say responsibility shifter. <laughs> Pilate's wife had warned him not to have anything to do with Jesus. No verse 23 and 24 as I begin to close this message. What crime has he committed? They asked. He shouted all, all, all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was what? Getting nowhere. Instead of uproar start, he took water and washed his hands. I think it's important. The symbolism here was that what he did, the custom was water represents purity. And since water represents purity, then water represents innocency. And so Pilate put his hand in the water and said, mm-mm. I'm innocent. But as he was thinking that he was pure, what he didn't realize as he put his hand in the water, that he was really putting his hand on blood. It was him. He could not absolve himself of that responsibility. Some of y'all not getting it still. I need some help. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you this question. What child is allowed to do what they want when they feel like it? by their parents. No. Pilate, you're guilty. As I close my message, while some of you under the sound of my voice are deciding what to do with Jesus in your life, I want you to know some that have got it clear. See, some people here are lost. They're trying to make a decision in the next five minutes the doors of the church will be opening. They're trying to make a decision whether Jesus should be their Savior. See, again, what will you do with Jesus? Other people in here are saved. Their issue is not so much whether he's their Savior. They've been baptized. Their issue is, is he going to be the Lord of their life? Is he going to be the one that rules and directs your life, or are you going to still be self-willed and self-driven? Again, what child is allowed to obey parents only when they feel like it. Others, and I'm closing out now, have already made up their decision about what to do with Jesus. Ask Jesus' father. You want to know, ask his daddy. 
The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 8, he tells us, God himself speaks from heaven and says about the Son. He says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. If you know that your responsive reading and you pull it out, note what it said, what the Father says about his Son. He says, even though the kings of the earth have risen up against him, so what? This is my interpretation. So what? The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. And in other words, ain't nothing nobody can do about it. Ask the father what he thinks about him. He will tell you, kiss the son. Kiss the son the son. Love the son. Care about the son. Oh, I'm not done. The Spirit started moving on me as I ended, closed this message out. As I asked the committed believers under the sound of my voice, if you're not a committed believer, then just sit in your seat and wait for the next few minutes. But I'm only talking right now to the committed believers. I'm talking to those who understood the price that was paid for their souls on Calvary. I'm talking to the ones that understand that they have been bought with a price and that therefore they are not their own. They belong to Christ. Every decision, every action, they have to go before the Lord. I'm talking about true, committed, blood-stained soldiers of the cross. A soldiers of Jesus. Not runners from Jesus. In the early church, they had a terrible problem. And here was the problem. In the third and fourth century of the church, when persecution came upon the church, there were a group of people that they served Jesus. They came to church as long as everything was fine. But once standing for Jesus became difficult, once standing for Jesus became an inconvenience, once standing for Jesus became something that they could be locked up for a kill, they left town. They packed up Elder Warren and left. And in history, they were called lapsers. In other words, they lapsed on out of the picture. And then when the persecution was over, here they come back. And so the scholars had to figure out, what do we do with these people? Do we accept them back in? And the final analysis, they left their judgment in the hands of God Almighty about their actions. But I'm here to tell you, God has not called you to be a lapser. God has called you to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. So when the question is asked, who is Jesus to you? You should be responding. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is sovereign God. He is holy. He is righteous God. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He is the God Almighty. And when someone asks you, what is he to you? Don't you be afraid to tell him. Don't be afraid to tell people that you love the Lord. Don't be afraid to tell people that he is the lover of your soul. When people ask you what you feel about him and what is he to you and ask you the ultimate relationship question, you can respond with he is my savior, he is my redeemer. He is Jehovah Tiskanu, my righteousness. He is Jehovah Shammah, he's there. Whenever I need him, he is my Jehovah Shalom. He is my peace. He is my Jehovah Rophi. He is the one who heals me. He is my Jehovah Rohi. He is my shepherd. I shall not want. And if you want to really get down personal with it, you got to be able to tell him, I can't live without him. What is he to me? I can't live without him. Well, what do you mean? He is the bread of life. He is the fountain of living water. He is the lily of the valley. He is the bright and morning star. And when I look up on Calvary, I just don't see a bruised, beaten, bewildered Jesus. When I look up on Calvary, I declare with the anointing of the Holy Ghost, he is altogether lovely. Thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to worshiping with you at either our 9 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. Sunday services that are biblically based, illustrative, contemporary, and timely. Our services cater to men, women, the young, and young at heart. We also invite you to join us 
for Tuesday night Bible study at 7.45 p.m. and Lunch on the Word on Wednesdays at noon. We are so thankful for your continued support of this ministry. And if this excerpt from our service touched your heart to either give financially to the ministry or to purchase the entire worship service on either CD or DVD, please call 708-283-0383 or visit us online at www.victoryapostolicchurch.org. 